ushers to come on tonight if they would and receive our Sunday night to tithe and, and offerings. I do appreciate you giving. As unto the Lord, the Lord knows the needs of our church. Um, I always go back and ask the finance committee when they're counting, how was their day? How did it go today? Some days they look at me with a smile and some days they don't smile so much. But God's always took care of us. He's always took care of us and he always will. So I ask you tonight to let the Lord speak to your heart about your giving and uh, give as unto the Lord. We've got a lot to do here at our church. A lot of prophetic words have been spoken over our church in the past few years. And I'm believing that that financial thing is going to be broken. Will somebody help me with that? That we'll believe that the finances of our church are going to get where we can just do ministry. And without, without all the other stuff that goes with it. I'm a firm believer that if everybody would do their part, if everybody paid their tithe, and everybody gave as unto the Lord, we wouldn't have to do all the things we have to do just to make it some time. And so I appreciate you giving tonight. Amen. Brother Chris, pray for us. Amen. It's great to have Brother Terry tonight. He's going to lead us in some singing, and uh, don't you love him? Amen. Uh, I, uh, I know that Lisa and Alan had to be out of town today, and I called Terry a few days ago and said, are you going to be with us? So let's stand tonight. Let's worship as he helps us tonight. Amen. There's a little chorus. I will bless thee, O Lord. I think you know it, so sing it with me. I will bless thee, O Lord.
black hymnal? Or yes, green, green back if you gave it that? Yes. Or blue or yellow, whatever it is. Page 184. He abides. Can you say praise God? The Holy Spirit abides. Praise God. Page or not, I tried to get a few seconds there. I'm rejoicing night and day. traveling on. Ah, yes, Lord. How many can be honest and say, sometimes I wonder if I can travel on or not. Amen. Yes, <laughs> but he never lets me down. He is faithful. Amen. Yes, Lord. And you know, it's an old song, but it is sure true. My heavenly home is bright and fair. When I get thinking about that, I think, well, I think I will travel on. Amen. I mean, what are my options? Hallelujah. It's a no-brainer. Somebody said, duh, it's heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
page 240. That's a good song for us to get happy with. Yes. And it says that a day is going to come. I'm not sure just theologically how this all fits together about a roll call. But I know one thing. My name is in the book of life. Yes. And I'm not going to be, I don't plan to be at the judgment of the great white throne. Oh, Praise right. God. Yes. I believe to be at the judgment seat, the beamer, yes. uh, where God's passing out rewards. Hallelujah. Hey, we're building yes. up treasure in heaven. Amen. You yes. did the day by going to church and giving your tithe and probably witnessing somebody this past week. You are building treasure in heaven. That's exactly right. And yeah. when the roll is called up yonder, however that's done, I'm not sure it's going to be a roll call. But I tell you one thing, I know there's going to be a trumpet call. And when yes. the trumpet sounds, we're in his presence, praise God. Come on. I don't know. Yes. I, don't, I just may start preaching tonight, and whoever was supposed to preach, you'll listen to that. Well, he's taking over. But anyway, it's, a, it's, it's just a wonderful song. Page 240. I forgot what the kids said. Let's try this. When the trumpet of the Lord jumps Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. It's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name. Jesus is the 
before you're seated and said, Aren't we blessed people? Aren't we favored people? We have the favor of the Lord. God is so good to us. Amen. You may be seated tonight. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Terry, so much for leading us in just good worship. I love those old songs, don't you? I just love those old songs and the hymn. We don't have them enough. I like the word balance. I've always used the word balance. A lot of churches have gone nothing but to that to the to the young music and those things, and left out some of the, the any of the older stuff. I believe you can have a balance in the church where people, everybody are blessed and everybody's touched. And I love those. I love all of that. I love to worship God. Whatever. I'm kind of like Tim Hill, though. Tim Hill said that uh, he can worship to any music, but he believed God pats his foot to Southern Gospel. Amen. So uh, God's good. It's good to have, if I remember right, Sister Boris back with us tonight. God bless you. Thank you for being here. She touched my heart Wednesday night, and she knows how she did that. It was really touching to my heart what she spoke into my life. It's good to see Linda here tonight. God bless you, Linda. Good to see Linda. It's good to have Madeline back today. I asked Madeline to come and sing for us. She's going to come sing for us right tonight before I, before I share the word that the Lord's put into my heart. Amen. Madeline uh, is a... Uh, one of the sweetest people I've met in a long time. She really is. And I, she is a choir teacher at uh, Lake Forest. And I've been talking with your friend over the last several days. Me and, uh, my goodness, we talked about okay. Works with you out there. Okay. What's her name? Uh, Renee Talley. Oh, Renee okay. Talley. Me and Renee has been talking. What a... I'm going to have Renee and her husband come minister here at the church, and so they're just great. But uh, uh, let's be blessed tonight. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you written in red. Amen. I could listen to that about 20 more minutes, couldn't you? Amen. Beautiful. Amen. I stand you tonight again humbled by that the Lord would even have me put the challenge in my heart to preach on this subject that I started last Sunday morning. I honestly stand here just overwhelmed. I, I really have put my heart into it. I, over the last two weeks, I have typed and written in nearly 40 pages now of notes to make sure that I've dug in to the Word of God to make sure that I get this right. Because if there's any subject that needs to be gotten right, it's this subject. I began last Sunday morning on a message that I titled, The Road to Blasphemy. The Road to Blasphemy. And you can turn back in your Bibles tonight to Matthew chapter 12. In fact, this will be our main text for several services now. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31 and verse 32. Over the next few weeks, I'll remind you again tonight that we began last Sunday morning by talking about the first step to blasphemy in the Holy Spirit would be that we quench the Holy Ghost. And that I believe that Pentecostals are more subject to doing that than any other denomination. Because we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And we can put ourselves in situations where we quench the Spirit of the Lord. And we talked about that. Then I began last Sunday morning about how that we grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't know exactly how long it might be tonight or next Sunday morning when I finish the part about grieving, but we've talked about different, different aspects of that. The next step to blaspheming the Holy Spirit is a person begins to resist yes. the Holy Spirit. Then after a person resists the Holy Spirit, there's this step called vexing the Holy Spirit. And the final step that I believe that a person has finally reached that place that they cannot be, be forgiven for is when they despise the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about those things. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. And every time I read it, it gets me. Oh, yeah. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Wow. Neither in this world or neither in the world to come. Father in heaven, I ask you tonight to please help me tonight. I stand before you begging you and pleading with you that you would anoint my lips with that anointing in my heart with that anointing that makes all things different and effective. And God, I will give you praise. Let us leave here tonight with, with a passion in our heart to make sure that we don't grieve you, Father. And God, I'll give you praise and I'll give you glory and I'll give you honor in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. And you may, you may be seated. You know, last Sunday we talked about the ways that we grieve the Spirit of the Lord. And we talked about quenching the Holy Spirit. We, we talked about uh, how, how that uh, uh, our negative speech and our uncontrolled emotions and our lying and our gossip, that it grieves the very Spirit of God. Then last Sunday night we talked about how it grieves the Holy Spirit when we are deceived by vain words, by believing the heretic, and by falling into believing the charlatans of our day and the false prophets. This morning we talked about uh, uh, the abusers that have slept into the church and how that men fall and women fall for the abusers of the church. How that one of the saddest stories found in Scripture yes. is that of David and Bathsheba and how he abused his authority. Yes. Brother Terry, some people believe that 
that Bathsheba was just some seductress. I believe she was raped. The king had authority. He had authority. He could either, he could have you killed if you didn't obey his commands. And I believe that he had Bathsheba brought to his quarters and he did with her what he wanted to and she was not a willing vessel. I really believe that. And we talked about how that he uh, uh, sends Uri Uriah out into battle and how has him killed and all of those things and how David himself used his authority in the wrong way and how that preachers of our day of how how that in a lot of the churches in the uh, in the catholic church how that hundreds and hundreds of little boys have been abused because they thought they had to respect the priest even in our own ranks we've had men and women who have abused children and women and uh and we talked about those abusers and how that truly truly breaks the very heart of God. So tonight I want to talk to you about two other, two other areas of two other men really or whoever it could be that if we follow in their footsteps and we follow their advice then we will surely be grieving the Holy Spirit of God. So tonight I want to talk to you about the divider. You see, the divider uses false doctrine to disrupt or destroy a church. And he gleefully divides brother from brother and sister from sister. Jude warned about him. He says this, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, yeah, sensual, having not the spirit you see the divider is devoid of the holy spirit whose first fruit is love and whose special work is holding believers together in the bond of peace in galatians 5 and 22 the bible says but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith then ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 the bible says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace you see this divider or the false teacher they will bring strife not love he generates factions not unity he desires discord and not harmony you see congregations and denominations have often been splintered by the divider as he promulgates his lies. He sometimes makes a minor doctrine into the mark of Christian maturity, causing factions to arise within the body. He may slyly introduce unbiblical doctrines yeah. or may undermine the very ordained leadership that he's under. He does it all for the perverse satisfaction that comes with destruction. See, all it took for over 1,800 churches to depart and separate their congregations from the United Methodist Church was for one or a few people powered by demonic forces to convince others that the gay lifestyle was acceptable to God. And that creeped into that denomination with the Terry. And 1,800 churches over the last year or so have separated themselves and made their own denomination. It only took one or just a few demonic influenced so called preachers to introduce the idea of cheap grace to the church. This morning I quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I'll quote him again tonight. Bonhoeffer saw the church of his day bowing the knee to cheap grace and he wrote this. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. It is grace without price. Grace without cost. Cheap grace means grace as a doctrine, an intellectual assent. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness 
without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, and communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, and grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And that's crept into the church, Brother Terry, because a few people, one or two people, introduced that, and people grabbed a hold of it. Yeah, Bonhoeffer's idea of cheap grace is flourishing in our churches and on our campuses and in our homes, and we don't even see it for what it is. Salvation is sold as fire insurance. Come on, that's right. Jesus is reduced to correct prop propositional formulas, and worship is all about us. And the way we like it, no matter how many times we sing. Cheap grace sells us uncomfortable Jesus, to whom we sing affectionate valentines. Cheap grace substitutes the fear of the Lord for the fear of the world. Cheap grace hides our light under wonderfully pious lampshades. And cheap grace renders the salt of the earth as just so much tasteless landfill. Yes, God help me. So truly I believe with my own eyes that I've witnessed this. All it takes is a few back with, the, with demonic influence to infiltrate ungodly doctrine into the church and divide the church. You know, we have those who want to change our deep-rooted belief in the initial evidence being that you will speak in tongues when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. There's people even in our ranks that are trying to introduce that that's no longer right. No, no longer should we look at that and say that's uh, the belief of our church. Let's change that, my Lord. And all it takes is a little few people. You see, little by little, false doctrine is trying to be introduced by these dividers that have accepted, Brother Terry, if we, if we start... I'm telling you, the day that we, we start calling God a woman is the day I ask my church, can we start our own church? Amen. Yeah, amen. Right. Right. Somebody help me just a minute. Right. Watering down the doctrines that we yeah. believed and fought for for so amen. long. Amen. God help us. And we're living in the day of dividers. Yeah, we are. That they want to divide the church. They want to divide us. This side and that side, and we have it. We have it among us. But you know, really, uh, and I, I just want to stop here and say, just in defense of the church, what happens is just like in the world. In the world, all it takes is a few people, and they sound real loud. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you look at the percentage of homosexuals in the world, you'd be amazed. Three, is it 3% now? 3% of, of the world, of the, whoever, are homosexuals. But how loud are they? You, you, you would think, Brother Terry, there are more of them than there are us. And uh, that, 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 that they're being pushed. And it's the same way in the church. It only takes a few loud mouths to make it seem like everybody believes that way. Because they want to divide us. They want to separate us. Amen. So God help us. And I believe when that division comes, it truly grieves the very heart of God. The Bible said in James chapter 3 and verse 16, for, for where envy and strife is, there's confusion 
and evil work. And every evil work. Matthew 12 and 22, the Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he, he healed him in so much that the blind and the dumb spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided, divided against himself. And, shall ha and how shall his kingdom stand? And if, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Then the kingdom of God is come upon you. How many believe with me tonight that God will hold back his blessings from a church or a home or a marriage that's become divided for any reason? On the other hand, how many are glad tonight that God commands his blessings? Did you hear what I said? That God commands his blessings when people are together and, and they're in unity. Well, well, just prove that to me, Pastor, in Psalms 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment and the dew of Hermon. And as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for there, I said for there, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Would somebody raise their hand and say, God, help us to stay together. Help us to be united. That you will command your blessings upon our life. My goodness. Our churches ought not be divided because we have one Lord and one Savior. Our churches ought not to be divided because we don't have two Lords. We have one Lord. One faith, not two faiths. One baptism, not two baptisms. Our churches ought not be divided because we have one mission. And that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. My goodness. The Bible said, He said, For I'm persuaded not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I need to tell you tonight that we're being watched. The church as a whole is being watched. When we become angry and divided, we're not only robbed of our joy, we're robbed of our effectiveness. When the world can't look at us and see that we're together. That we've got our minds together and we've got our mission together and we've got our passion together. And they look in and see division. Uh, you ever heard somebody say this and it's an indictment against the church? I don't want to go to church because I already live as good as those people live. You ever heard that? I've heard that, Brother Terry. And that's an indictment against us. We're not going to affect the world, Brother Johnny, like we need to until we get unified in the body of Christ and live right and live holy and live right before the Lord. The Lord and the world looks at us and say, I want what they have. They're not divided like I am. That Their homes aren't messed up like I am. I, I, I want what they've got. And we get unity back in the house of God. My goodness. Amen. I'm telling you, as a pastor, over the years, I've learned. Does anybody watch uh, Andy Griffith? My son watched so much Andy Griffith, that's how he told time. True story. He's won contests over the nation on the internet of answering uh, Andy Griffith questions. He's amazing. But there's one episode, and, and everybody can remember it. 
Barney said you need to nip it in the bud. Does anybody remember that? Nip it in the bud. If a pastor's got any good sense at all, when he feels the vision happening in a church, he'll find the source and the root of the problem. And he'll nip that in the bud. Because if we ever get divided, listen to me. If, we'll ever, if we ever get divided, we'll never win our families. We'll never win our children. We'll never win our community. We must stay united for the purpose of going out into the harvest that's lost and preaching the gospel to him. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when we allow division to come. My Lord, help me. I'm glad we still got some young men coming up behind me. I'm getting old. That still believe in the ways of the Lord. And I believe can pick up the mantle and go on with the church. I really believe that. Not only is there a divider, but let me talk to you tonight for the last thing today. I'm tired. I want to talk to you about the ticklers of our day. That grieved the Holy Spirit. This was amazing to me. I thank the Lord for giving me this thought today. In 2005, cancer patient Georgia Hayes won a $2.2 billion court settlement against her pharmacist who had diluted her chemotherapy drugs with water. In the process, she had lost her best chance of recovery. And while $2.2 billion is a lot of money, it's little comfort when you don't have long to live. Amen. That's right. That's right. Dilute means to make thinner, yeah, to lessen the strength, to adulterate, to reduce value of, of efficiency, and to make fainter or to water down. Right. What could be more deadly than diluting cancer medication down. How would you like to be a patient that had cancer and you had your trust in the doctor and the pharmacist come on, come on. that that drug was going to heal you but somebody had added water to it, yeah. then you found out that you was going to die. Maybe uh, a placebo pill for a cardiac patient how would you like to be dying of a heart attack and then give you a placebo does anybody know what that is just a sugar pill or a so how would you like to be dying of a heart attack and the doctor give you a medicine that's watered down and you go ahead and die of that heart attack what about insulin medicine where would I be today if I went today and got my in insulin medicine from the drugstore and I brought it home and, my, and, I, and I ate some food and I took my medicine and it didn't have an effect because the pharmacist had watered down the insulin medicine. But actually the most deadly medicine that is watered down is the gospel Amen. of our day. Because the tragic results of that are eternal. They are eternal. eternal. You see, the tickler is the false teacher who cares nothing for what God wants and everything for what men wants. He is the man pleaser rather than the God pleaser. Paul thought of him as an ear tickler in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. He said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come and we are here when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to them selves, teachers, they'll want them to. They'll desire them to. Having itching ears. And they shall 
turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. You see, Tickler craves popularity and praise from the world. To maintain his followers' respect, he preaches only parts of the Bible that deem acceptable. Therefore, he speaks much about happiness, but little about sin. Much about heaven, but nothing about hell. He gives them only what they want to hear. He preaches a partial gospel, which is really no gospel at all. He preaches an empty gospel to a packed out church. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when we'd rather be told a fable or a cute story than to be preached the meat of the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. For the preaching of crosses to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power. It is the power of God. God help me. You know something I've had to do in the last few days? And this is one of those pastor confessions. I've had a lot of people to tell me, boy, pastor again, you preach, you just preach it. You just, you just put it like it is. And I've thought about that, Brother Terry. I never want to come across, and I don't ever want my preaching to be like, you know, I'm just hung up on that. That's just me. But God forbid if I preach not the gospel. Amen. That's Amen. Exactly right. That's right. Amen. That's it. God forbid Amen. if I preach not the gospel. Woe is me. Woe is me. That's right. If I preach not the gospel. You see, the gospel of Christ is the very power of God that saves men exactly. from his holy wrath against our sins. Amen. When preached with anointing, it sets people free from captivity to sin and death. It breaks people free from a pointless and purposeless life. And it allows for a powerful Christian life that exhibits the authority and the likeness of Christ himself. However, many preachers or ear ticklers have watered down the gospel reducing it to merely a message of escape from condemnation without repenting of sin. Amen. A message of affirmation as a son or daughter of God without obedience to the Father. Right. A message of comfort without denying oneself yes. to pursue His will. Or a message of forgiveness without realizing how much we have offended a holy and righteous God. Yeah with the sin that we commit. Yes. While it's true enough, while God and the message of the gospel, it doesn't change. However, the last, the latter is communicated by today, lacks the power that it actually possesses. And this is sad. Sadly, this lack causes many people to have the wrong belief that they believe in God but don't actually believe in Christ. Many Christians today make the wrong assumption that they are saved simply because God loves them. God loves you. You're all right. Going to be all right. God loves you. While it's true that salvation is made available through God's love and act of giving up His one and only Son for our sakes, we need to realize that we have a part to play in that. You see, receiving His gift of salvation in Christ means turning away from sin and coming under the Lordship of Christ. And we do that by faith. The cross of Christ is God's power 
to those that are saved. As such, we must not water it down. Only the full power of the gospel can save us. And watered down crosses will never do it. I want to close tonight with three ways that the gospel of Christ is being watered down in the day that we live and it grieves the heart of God. When we remove the terrifying danger of God's impending wrath against our sin, Brother Terry, that grieves the heart of the Holy Spirit. God sent His Son to save us while we were still lost in our sin. And our sin deserved God's wrath. Brother Patrick. And what a wrath it is if we keep on focusing only, only on God's love and fail to balance it with the God's righteousness and anger against our sin, we will dilute the very reason that Christ had to die on the cross. Amen. Amen. Our situation was so terrible, dire, that it took God's only son to save us. It's a punch and a slap in the face of God to believe that we can live any way we want to and still be all right with God. Slap him in the face. But people don't want to hear about the wrath of God. They don't want to hear that if you sin, there's a place called hell. And if you're not forgiven of that sin, you will spend an eternity there in a place that was not even made for you, but for the devil and his angels. So it grieves the very Spirit of God when we, re we remove the terrifying danger of God's impending wrath against our sin. Amen. Wow. People don't want to hear that. They want to live like they want to live. A young preacher, I was just a kid preacher, begging for places to preach. Brother Johnny, I laid my head on the wall and wept like a baby because I understood if it wasn't for those women and men, I would not even have a pulpit to preach in today. And I get sick of people talking about them. Yeah, they went to some extremes. Their hair had to be so much long and their dresses had to be certain lengths and they... And they wouldn't drink coffee and they wouldn't drink Coke. They wouldn't go to movies and they wouldn't go to ball games. They wouldn't be caught swimming with the opposite sex. And we talk about those people. But you know why they did it? It's because they wanted to please God. And they were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that they pleased God. Because they knew what it was not to please God, Brother Yogi. They knew about the wrath of God. But now, we're on this side. We went to extremes. And we want to see how far we can go and still please God. We want to see what we can get by with. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And still be all right. Still get a pat on the back. That's a good boy. Good girl. Just keep on what you're doing. No, we better realize the wrath of God is real. Amen. The love of God passes every bit of understanding, but the wrath of God is real. Amen. And it grieves the very heart of God and the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but we grieve the Holy Spirit when we make accepting Christ more powerful than the act of repentance. Have you heard of people leading others into a sinner's prayer and then stopping at that? Don't get me wrong, I prayed that prayer too. But merely accepting Christ as Savior without denying to ourselves and repenting from our sins just won't cut it. No. Repentance is the fruit of our salvation. And a changed life is proof that we've repented of our sins. When we are made to accept Christ without us understanding the terrible price that Christ had to pay for our sakes, we take his suffering for granted. 
and it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. And lastly, when we try to replace the simplicity of the gospel with useless eloquence, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Many nowadays try to explain the gospel using many words that don't actually reveal how dreadful it is to be under the law of sin and how terribly great the cost of Christ paid for our redemption and how immensely great the amount of gratefulness we should have for God's grace and mercy for us. Amen. I've heard many try to communicate the, com communicate the gospel and I'm, I'm really tired of this in a politically correct manner. I don't preach politics, but I preach morals. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I, I don't preach politics. I just preach morals. And that's what politics is all about today, really, is, is, is morals. That's... That's what they want, good or bad. And so, uh, and today we try to stay so politically correct because we don't want to offend nobody, you know. Well, might lose tithe in the church. Let me tell you, you can believe this or not, but I'd rather have to go back home Sunday nights. How many times do I do that, Daisy? And say, how was today? How was today, Daisy? Before I walked out of the office tonight, I, I looked at her and I, I said, make sure I say this right. I said, you sure you got enough to give me this? And hallelujah, we did. Amen. But I'm telling you, I'd rather have to walk back there and ask every Sunday, is it okay today? Than to have a million dollars in the bank. Amen, brother. Yeah. Come on. And have a church full. That's it. That's it. And me preach to them in a way that Amen. they'll miss that place called heaven. I'll lose a millionaire any day of the week over Amen. preaching the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. You better believe I would. Amen. You better believe I would. Amen. I'd lose my biggest tithe pay in the church as they came up against me and said, you better not preach that no more. I'll lose them. Because here's a fact. I will stand before him one day and give an account if I preach the gospel or not. That if I beg and plead and preach what thus saith the word of God. Because I don't want that man or your blood to be on my hands. And so, yes, I refuse to preach a politically correct gospel. And in ear tickling ways, fatally failing to communicate its tremendous power and failing to set people free. It's the only thing that set them free. The truth has set them free. Would you come on, Brother Terry? The truth has set them free. And those things, man, do they ever, do they ever hurt the heart of God? Sure do. The Holy Spirit grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I tell you, I felt that other day, man, I, I was overwhelmed the other day when Jovi started home last week. Friday from Thursday I guess it was from camp she'd been gone all week and they'd stayed all night with us that first night Joby and Thatcher had and Caleb and Nikki went on up to the camp they came back on Thursday and Joby said Papa I want to stay with you Papa and Grant I want to stay with you we knew she couldn't she had to get home and they had to get all close cleaned up from camp and I said, sweetheart, you're coming back next weekend. And it hurt her. And she began to bawl. Papa, Grant, I want to stay with you. 
I want to stay with you. And I thought she was playing, though. I looked back and tears are just rolling down her face. You're talking about breaking my heart. You talking about wanting to get in the car and go with her? Because <laughs> that broke my heart. You know, we break the heart of God like that. He's an emotional God. People think He's not emotional. He's an emotional God. The Holy Spirit's emotional. That's why you can grieve Him. Never forget that He's a person. He's not an it. He's not some kind of a... He's the third person of the Godhead. And I don't want to grieve Him. And I, won't, I don't want to grieve Him by dividing the church, division. If you ever find yourself in any way that you could be dividing the church, back up, look at yourself, take inventory, because that's one of the steps to lead into blasphemy in the Holy Ghost. If you were to ever bring division in the church, has anybody ever walked into a church, into a church that was divided? That's the worst feeling in the world. To walk into a church that you can feel the division. That's why I don't like cliques. Somebody say amen. Four or five people here and four or five people there. No, we're the body of Christ. We're all one body. It's not cliques. It's not you and me, it's us. Hallelujah. So if you ever find yourself in a way that you can divide the church back up and take inventory because you'll grieve the very heart of God when you do that. And make sure that you're not pleased with preachers and believe in preachers who want to tell you nothing but fables and stories and pat you on the back who smile real big <laughs> and make you feel good God help me tonight would you stand with me Amen I, I really appreciate the Lord letting me think about that today about what sense would it be of taking a chemotherapy medicine and it water down and kill you, not help you. What in the world is the gospel worth if it's watered down where it can't help men's souls and touch their lives? If we're going to do that, you may think I'm funny. I love fishing too much just to come here and tell you fables and stories. If I'm going to do that, Sister Madeline, I, I might as well just go fishing or something. Get me a fishing pole on Sunday and catch me a fish. Because it ain't going to do none of us no good. No water. Look, if, if I ever start that, Terry, watch it. I may be down there on Sunday morning. But a watered-down gospel ain't going to help us. And I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt him. Would you lift your hands tonight and love him all over this place? Would you just love the Lord all over this place? Draw closer to you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing to do.
Somebody, would you come on up with me tonight? Would you come on up with me? after no less of a church than he left. A glorious church without spot and without wrinkle. That's who he's coming back after. So I just don't believe what the down stuff's going to get it. I just don't believe a fable and a joke or two is going to get it. But I believe we're going to have to live by what thus saith the word of the living God. Pastor again, that offends me. Well, good. A oh, good. It goes, it goes against the grain. The Word of God's kind of like sandpaper. <laughs> the more you rub it, I'm telling you, it gets to you. God help me. Would you lift your hands one more time and pray this prayer? And it's all, now listen to me. Remember, He's the third person of the Godhead God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And we sing a song that Jesus is all we need. That's not the truth. We need God the Father. We need God the Son. And we need God the Holy Ghost. And I never thought about it till lately. But I believe it's all right to love on the Holy Ghost. I believe it's all right to say, I, I love you that you're my comforter. Would you do that tonight? Would you just tell me, I, I love you that you're my comforter. I love you that you're my guide. I love you that you're my convictor of my soul. I love you and I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you, sir, because God sent you to me. God sent you to me. And I don't want to hurt you. And it is amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. That you can say God's name in vain and a truly repentant heart can be forgiven of that. That you can speak a word against the Son of God and be forgiven of that. But whoso speaks a word against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven in this world or the world to come. And I want to find out what that is. I, and I'm trying to dig, I'm trying to get in there, show us and lead us how to not do that because none of us want to do that. None of us want to do that. Does anybody have anything special in your life tonight that you want us to pray about? Let me take this opportunity to say that that uh, I appreciate you watching us online or visiting us in service. It's also all, always a privilege. I had somebody to stop by this Wednesday night and say to me that they'd been watching us online and how that the Word of God had touched their hearts and that humbled me. And I pray that I can always preach the truth in love and love and, but also preach with conviction. So I, I appreciate you watching us. Uh, if you feel a desire and ever feel uh, like the Lord's speaking to you to give to our local church ministries, I encourage you to do that. You can do that by going to easytithe.com and finding Prospect Church of God there. And uh, you can do that. And I believe there's a QR code there that you can use there that take you directly into our, our giving website. We appreciate that. We are a small church with a big heart. And trying to do ministry is tough in the day we live. So I would encourage you to do that if at all possible. And uh, I'm not asking you to take tithe from your local church. Your tithe belongs to your local church, not ours. Uh, but maybe there's an offering that you would feel like giving to our church. And I would 
I really appreciate that. God bless you. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, would you bless those that have joined us today? I pray that something that was said through your word will confront us. And I pray, I pray for people's physical needs, emotional needs, needs, their families, physical needs. And I love you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.